Hello, my name is Sally Gunn, and I have found a story about a boy I never knew about, but he was very real. His mother named him Ramanujan. Today's story is called The Boy Who Dreamed of Infinity by Amy Aldsnauer and Daniel Miyaris. It's about a boy who thought constantly about numbers, their relationship to each other, to the world, and to his life. He was born in Madras in the southeastern section of India. And here is a kind of artistic map. You can see the continent of Africa. And here is the country of India. He was born right about there in Madras. It's a country that is, a, it's a tropical place of mangoes and rice and monsoons, where many people are Hindus and have many gods. There are 14 official languages in India, and he spoke Tamil. But aren't numbers wonderful? You do not need words or language to express an idea with mathematics. I just peeled a mandarin orange, and I found that there were inside 10 relatively equal sections. If I took them apart, I could have two equal halves, put them back together, still have one. If I ate one of the ten sections, I will have eaten one-tenth and have nine-tenths left. It was that sort of thing that he started to think of, but then he thought of many more complicated and elaborate theoretical ideas about numbers. His mind was full, bursting with ideas about numbers and what they meant to the world. Ramanujan was a numbers theorist, and he lived a mo little more than a hundred years ago, but his ideas and his theories are still relevant today. At one point, when he was an adult, Many learned mathematicians in the world went to see him and honored him. Sometimes a brilliant person has no one around him who understands him. Today, the world is small. With a single click, you can see anywhere or speak to anyone. But 100 years ago, the world was big. It took weeks to send a letter by steamer from here all the way to there. But back then, if you had an idea, even a rare and wonderful idea on one side of the world, people on the other side might never know. Your idea might forever stay where it began, right here in a small village in South India by the banks of the Kaveri River in Amma's arms. Amma held her new baby. She touched his tiny pink tongue and told him about his grandmother's dream. Before you were born, she said, the goddess Namagiri leaned down and whispered into your grandmother's ear that someday she would write the thoughts of God on your tongue. Amma gazed into her baby's bright eyes. But how could someone so small ever grow up to say something so big? Through the window with no glass, she showed him the stars. I will call you Ramanujan, she said. For three years, he stayed quiet as a mouse. China Swami, my little lord, Amma begged, what are you thinking? Ramanujan just lined up the copper pots across the floor, and when he didn't get his curd, rice, and mango, he rolled in the monsoon mud. He must have been very frustrated. His grandfather tried to help. He held Ramanujan's finger, and together they traced numbers in rice. Onru, Irandu, Munru, his grandfather counted out loud in Tamil. One, two, three. Soon Ramanujan began to talk. What is small? he asked. He imagined the world with only one man before anyone was there to hear him speak. And what is big? He looked up at the big blue space between clouds. At five years old, long hair up in a knot, 
white dhoti tied around his waist. He started school, just half a dozen boys on the front porch of a house. But when the teacher took no interest in his odd questions, Romanojan grew bored. He tried again and again to sneak away. As he grew, he often thought about his grandmother's dream. There was something out there beyond his tiny stucco house, whispering. Was it calling him? Nah, 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 said the goats in the street. What else is small, Romano John wondered. He remembered the legend of the single egg that cracked open to reveal the entire universe. He thought about a mango. A mango is like an egg. It is just one thing, but if I chop it in two, then chop the half in two, and keep on chopping, I get more and more bits on and on endlessly to an infinity I could never even reach. Yet, when I put them back together, I still have one mango. He loved this idea, small and big, each inside the other. If he could crack the number one open and find infinity, what secrets would he discover inside other numbers? It felt like he was setting out on a grand chase. Numbers were everywhere, in the squares of light pricking the thatched roof at his house, in the gods dancing on the temple tower, in the clouds that formed and reformed in the sky. Every day he wrote numbers in the sand, on his slate, on slips of paper, his slender fingers flying, each number a new catch. In school, numbers were different, stiff and straight, obeying the rules. When the children chanted sums, Ramanujan thought, but aren't there more sums inside of those sums? He broke the numbers into smaller and smaller bits. In every number like this, a single body but with many parts, ignoring the class, he scratched wildly on his slate, his elbow darting up to erase. What are you thinking, said the schoolmaster, making such a racket on your slate and refusing to listen. He made Ramanujan put his finger over his lips and sit, sit in the corner. Romano John hated school. Once the town constable had to chase him back to his studies. So every year his parents tried a different school. They finally settled on Kangayan Primary. Ama sang songs in the temple. Appa sold fabric in a shop. His friends played goli gun gundu, shooting marbles in the street. But Romano John was shy and liked to be alone. Every day he rushed home from school to sit on the front pial of his house, long hair coming loose from its knot, slate across his knees. Often it looked like he was staring off into nowhere. But it was not nowhere. Out there, numbers leaped and roared. He could see them even when his eyes closed. Are you a genius? A friend called up to him one day. I don't know, Romano John called back. But if I am, my elbow is making a genius of me. He held up his elbow, smudged from erasing the slate. Then he was at it again, writing and erasing, as if perfecting a sketch. What else is big, he needed to know. If I can break a number into so many sums, how many sums do I get if I take bigger and bigger numbers? When will it be too big to count? He wrote until his fingers ached. In the summers, when it was too hot to think, he chalked numbers on the cool temple floor. High up in the pillars, bats fluttered. He was like an archaeologist, dusting off the hidden bones of each number to find its structure. Do numbers also break apart by multiplying? He wondered. Now he ended up with numbers like two, three, and five, with no smaller pairs inside them. How many numbers like this are there? And how do I find them? There was no book with an answer, no one to ask. He just had to write and think. In the evenings, while Romano John scribbled away and stuck, stuffed sticky rice balls in his mouth, Ama sang about the gods. 
She told of the tiny fish who grew to be as big as an ocean, and the little boy who once saw a great golden lion man break out of a pillar of stone. Everything in the whole world is about small and big, thought Romanojan. He watched a spark float up and away from the fire. And at night, while he slept, numbers came whispering in dreams. When he woke, an idea would be there as if placed on the tip of his tongue. He'd write furiously, trying to catch the golden thought before it had fled. When Ramanujan turned 10 years old, he entered, entered Kumbakorum Town High School, where a schoolmaster finally saw that he was lightning quick. He solved tricky problems in a flash. He made up magic squares to stump his friends. Often, Romanojan was quiet, but when his classmates got him talking, the words gushed out and his eyes glowed, mischievous and sparkling. He was like no one they had ever known. He took food to the man who ranted down by the Kaveri River. The man stared into the sun and said that he could see odd creatures running about. But this did not seem strange at all to Romanojan. Sometimes even invisible things can be real, he told his friends. When he was 15 years old, he got his hands on a college math book. It had thousands of questions, but no answers. Romanojan answered the questions, all of them. And when the questions ran out, he made up more. He started writing down his ideas in a notebook with a green pen. The blank pages thrilled him, all that paper just waiting for his work. Romanojan tried to write neatly, but then he'd catch the whisper of an idea. Numbers would rush across the pages in circles and packs. Ama watched him, remembering the dream. Are those the thoughts that Namagiri placed on his tongue? She wondered. As Romanojan grew older, his questions got bigger. How many sums are inside 200? How many numbers like 2 and 3 and 5 are there up to 10 million? It would take an impossibly long time to count that high. He discovered intricate formulas and patterns to answer his questions. No one told him how math is supposed to be done, so he did it his own way. He devised his own symbols. He worked out ideas that no one had ever thought before. Will an endless list of tiny numbers add up to one or to infinity? Will it be like the bits of mango or the countless stars in the sky? He found beautiful ways to tell different lists apart. But when Ramanujan entered college, he could not focus on anything except for math, and he flunked out. At 20 years old, he had nothing, no college degree, no job, only a notebook covered in strange green ink. He was back on the piano of his house, writing fervently on his slate. Sometimes his family did not have enough to eat, so a neighbor fed him butter and rice. Ama put her foot down. She had had enough of sitting on porches and writing on slates. She arranged his marriage and demanded that Ramanujan get a job. Carrying his notebooks under his arm like a diploma, he went door to door asking for work. Everyone saw that he was brilliant, maybe even a genius, but they didn't quite know what to do with him. He finally landed a job as a clerk keeping accounts at the Port Trust in Madras. Still, he did math every chance he got, sometimes late into the night, scraping on his slate. One night, tired of the noise, a friend dumped a bucket of water onto his head and cried, what are you thinking? Ramanujan looked up, his long hair dripping, his eyes shining. I am small, he said. God is big. I am trying to learn the thoughts of God. He often walked on the long Madras beach and looked out at the ocean. I am like the first man in the world with no one to hear me speak, he thought. 
He watched the steamers pass in the distance. Were these thoughts really meant for him alone? Secrets to be caught and kept forever? Wasn't there anyone anywhere out there that he could tell? Local mathematicians and British overseers at the Port Trust became convinced that Romanujan was extraordinary. But nobody that they knew was working on similar mathematical ideas. Was anybody in the world? They urged him to write a letter. I beg to introduce myself, he began, and wrote out his strange symbols and ideas. He sent the letter by steamer to Cambridge University, one of the great mathematical centers in England. Weeks went by, nothing. He tried again and again. Romano John would try one more time. He wrote to G. H. Hardy, one of the top mathematicians at Cambridge. He had recently discovered Hardy's pamphlet on infinity. Maybe Hardy would understand. Romano John waited and waited. Finally, a letter came back and Romano John tore it open. Hardy was astonished. How did Romano John come up with such outlandish, magnificent ideas? And would he come to England? Romano John's whole life had been building to this moment. He desperately wanted to share his work, but could he really leave his home? He went to the temple to pray. After some time, a whisper seemed to come in a dream. Speak the thoughts on your tongue. So, Romano John said goodbye to Ama and Appa and his young wife. He cut his long hair, and on a bright March morning in 1914, he packed up his notebooks, took one small step onto the steamer, and set out from here all the way to there. As he rocked on the steamer and gazed up at the great night sky, so full of stars that it looked like a glittering infinity, he never could have guessed that someday scientists would use his ideas to help explore that sky and that his work would change the course of mathematics forever. One hundred years later, people would still search his notebooks in wonderment trying to discover what he was thinking. I hope you enjoyed that. I know that I did. <laughs>